Uh, so we've got Brian, as I said just a second ago, with us. Um, and so I'll kind of just change yourself a little bit better. Very cool. Uh, so my name is Brad Hubbard. I'm the uh, product line manager at uh, Brian Arms. So we're um, based out of Morgan, Utah. Um, we're owned by Belgian Group called Arsenal, but um, I'm in charge of all technical apparel products. So um, that's kind of my wheelhouse where we live uh, in terms of product line. So I've been doing uh, product management for about 15 years now. Always. Uh, in technical outerwear, this is uh, my first kind of jump into the uh, hunt space, so it's kind of been a learning curve for me. So I've been there, uh, this is my fourth season. Um, but uh, like I said, I'm always doing technical outerwear and footwear as well. So a lot of this was relevant experience to where I come from, but um, a little bit different place. So um, Jason invited me up today to just kind of talk to you guys a little bit about what product line managers do. So um, I'll put together a few slides about basically what, um, you know, just a quick overview of what the functions are, what a product line manager does, but then I thought more relevant for you guys um, like to see is kind of um, just like a case study about how you get together a product line and, um, you know, kind of how the whole process works. So I want this to be really um, transactional for you guys, so if there's any questions, like feel free to stop and kind of interrupt me, so this is be um, really high level, but I would prefer that you guys have questions. Um, first up, so um, these are just kind of the key points. I mean, if you read the job description of what a product line manager does, um, this would kind of be a year so, um, cross functional leader from concept to commercialization. Um, so, product design and development. So, I oversee all of our um, design and development teams. So, um, we have a designer works on contract outside the building, so uh, we get a lot of questions about why we use outside design as opposed to internal design. So for us, um, you know, we're in a small town in Utah, you know, that, um, that really drives a lot of um, the concepts and what people's believing beliefs are about our product lines. We like to um, use outside designers to kind of give us some influence, so we're not necessarily um, developing inside of a package, so that's really important to us. Uh, so we have one developer on our team. I guess I should mention that as well. So our developer actually was um, hired out of your guys' program. So um, he came on as an intern, uh, did headwear for us, um, which is actually not under um, the apparel umbrella. Um, he did a really fantastic job. So we had an opening for him and uh, we brought it into apparel. So um, what you guys are doing now is actually um, you know, a really great opportunity to step into these positions as well. And then, um, Doug Hines, who is, uh, I believe, a senior this yep. year. So he's actually uh, interning for us right now. So um, I guess just a side note, like we really believe in this program. We think what you guys are doing um, is fantastic. So there's a lot of opportunity in terms of um, you guys focusing in on, you know, really being a part of the process. And um, we want to make sure that we're a part of that too. So, um, so, tell you better, but, um, so our developer um, came from the school. So um, design briefs and development direction. So um, that's something that I'm basically in charge of making sure that um, our design team as well as development have the briefs, really understand what the product line is, um, kind of where we're heading, um, make sure they fully understand it. So when I'm passing it off, that um, you know, they kind of know where to take it from there. So marketing and PR. So this is a, like a cross-functional arm of um, what we do product line management, so um, marketplace product and product positioning, so uh, I'm really giving our marketing team kind of the overall concept and view of, you know, these products fit into the marketplace um, here and here and based on price point and giving them all that data so they can fully understand um, why we're developing the products that we are and, and how they should really um, fit into the rest of the marketplace. Um, partner relationship group, so we're fortunate that we have, um, you know, a building for full of hardcore users, and then we also have partner groups. So, um, specific to what we're doing right now, so we redeveloped our um, Upland line last season. <coughs> um, we're partnered with Pheasants Forever, so um, they're one of the largest bird conservation groups that are um, putting 
as much land into conservation as possible. So we're really fortunate in having this group of um, basically a, a hundred like super hardcore users that are able to um, give our product to initially and tell me to go out and beat this product to shit and, and come back and give us all of your feedback. So um, we really rely on a lot of those partner groups, um, not just from a product testing standpoint, but also um, in terms of product launch. So when we're doing our go-to-market strategy, that we're relying on those people there. Um, really the authentic voice of, uh, of the user to, to help us really, you know, push it out into the market. Uh, go to market strategies. So as I said, you know we're we're using these partner relationship groups, and we're showing our marketing team like um, where these where the opportunity is to you know really launch it, as well as um, uh, making sure that we have all of our um, <coughs> sponsored athletes, so um, people that are on hunting TV shows, as well as um, Instagram influencers, um, all those social media groups. So uh, and when we're talking about our go to market strategy, we're um, pulling in all of those players and saying like this is how these people um, really relate and interact. Um, technology and packaging. So technology um, in terms of uh, what the materials we're using, uh, you know, what the sourcing strategy kind of looks like. So everything from uh, you know I manage mean, our relationship well with the Cortex license. So um, that's a huge part of what we're doing in terms of technical outerwear that really tells the retail story for us. So. Learning a lot about our technologies and communicating those to market and make sure um, they're really telling that message. So, um, you know, in terms of waterproof breathable membrane stores, probably or is the most expensive on the market. So, uh, we want to make sure that it's being um, you know marketed well and we're talking about that. So, that's a key part of that uh, packaging. So, our marketing team uh, really helps us uh, with the final packaging strategies as well. But um, as product line managers, uh, we're making sure that. Um, they're telling the story um, that we've got all the correct hang tags, that it's exactly how it looks. Um, Final photography. So, interestingly, I was on the phone on the way up here. So, ahead of season, we're shooting um, all of our products um, that are launching for um, fall 20. So, right now, we're shooting a holiday promotion for a new um, real tree launch pattern in our. Pants were lost in Bangladesh, so we've all been up all night trying to find out where our missing pants are for an elk shoot that's happening in a few hours from now. So um, that's one of the exciting parts of the job. So um, it's a really dynamic work environment. Um, I mean, I won't sugarcoat it. There's a ton of late hours and hard work. Um, you're communicating with factories that are um, 12 hours different from you. So you know, 2 a.m. phone calls are not out of the question. You're up late, you're up early. That's just you know kind of part of the hustle is we manufacture outside of the country. So, um, but that final photography component is uh, really important in terms of not unsimilar to any other outdoor brands. A lot of what we are marketing towards is the aspirational customer. So even though they um, may not get to take the once in a lifetime doll sheep hunt um, in Alaska, they want to feel like they're part of that. So um, we really focus our, tra our strategy in photography make sure that they feel like they're part of that and that they can really understand the concept that we're going towards. So um, final photography is super important in terms of the market strategy, making sure we have those assets. So um, not only when we're selling it to the wholesale channel, but as it launches to the consumer that uh, we're providing retailers with the assets that they need to um, really launch the product. Um, sales. So these are sales and planning are um, really two key components. So I've highlighted sales margin and turn. So that's really the holy trinity of what we talk about as product line managers. So we're product centric and obsessed and hardcore users and all that. But at the end of the day, um, I'm the one that's responsible to make sure that we have money at the bank at the end of the year and that we're um, meeting the margin. And sales goals that our executive leadership um, sets out for us. So, um, you know, it's kind of a concept where I try to uh, remove myself from from design and development um, at some point because I unfortunately have to be the bad guy that says we can't use waterproof zippers everywhere or even though you guys may have created the coolest jacket ever, we can't really afford it and it doesn't fit into our product line or uh, retailers can't make the margin or it doesn't really fit into that strategy. So um, the sales and planning portion of it um, is, is really more of the business aspect. So in terms of what product line managers do, um, that's a really key component. So profit and loss responsibility at the end of the day, um, whether it's um, setting up salesman samples or 
um, talking about inventory turns and planning, um, that ultimately comes down to me to make sure that our costing is aligned and they, um, we're actually budgeted for the products um, that we're looking to uh, put into the marketplace. Uh, management of map and wholesale, so minimum advertised pricing. Um, so as retailers are becoming more uh, omni-channel and not just brick and mortar retailers, um, everybody's starting to sell online, which kind of creates this um, mess that we um, have to manage in terms of how people are pricing their products and making sure that we're pro pro me, protecting our um, product integrity by saying you can't just buy products and sell them wherever you want, right? So ultimately we have to make sure that everyone is selling at the same map price so it's a, a fair and level playing field for all of our wholesale chains. Um, and then just managing our wholesale and uh, retail costing list. So a lot of that comes down to price comparisons as well as um, just kind of looking at what's going on in the marketplace <coughs> and making sure that we're hitting margins and that we're giving the retailers that are <coughs> um, So planning, I work uh, directly with the demand planner. Um, so turns is kind of the final concept. So turns is really um, monthly average inventory versus divided by sales. So um, it's it's a number to make sure that our inventory is turning at least um, a certain amount of times per year. So our turns turns goal is actually different from what retailers. So whereas um, retailers might be planning on five turns, um, a wholesaler might only be looking at three turns. And a lot of that is a product of um, what minimum order quantities are, um, and what the expectations are in terms of what we can sell out to the wholesale channel. Do we have any questions yet? Okay. Sorry, just about the turns. So what, what, new, or not what new product, but like what product changes? Like, like which specific products are gonna change? Like is it just your, your camera patterns, or is it like? So turns is actually a, a planning goal, so that's really just a dollar amount to make sure. So if we're saying that we want, um, trying to simplify it, if we're saying that we want um, three turns per season, that means we're only holding at any given time about a third of our overall budget. So that way, the inventory turns the time. So that's really just a cost control to make sure um, we're not over inventory at any point in the season. Uh, in terms of in terms of product turns or um, what is changing every season? So there's a lot of new patterns that come out right now. As I was saying, the product or the uh, photo project that we have going today is um, based around a new real tree pattern. Um, it's Western specific. So um, you know we're not a camo brand, and I think a lot of people uh, you know kind of get that mixed up in terms of um, how we work with real tree and mossy oak, and then we have a proprietary pattern in ATAX. So, um, but all of them are branded camos that are basically licensing agreements that um, we use to uh, push out their camo patterns. So we don't actually internally develop camo patterns, but we use their marketing um, and their heavy lifting power. So what their wheelhouse is is really making those camo patterns and they bring them to us. Um, they're kind of a uh, marketing machine in terms of their reach is a lot further or farther than ours is. Um, so as they're launching those and we're doing it together with them, they're kind of pushing out some of those parts. Is there another question? Sorry. Yes. Um, so you're working with like essentially factories overseas. Does that mean you travel a lot? It does. Yeah. So uh, I flew 180,000 miles last year. Just got back from was in China. Um, so we do China, uh, Indonesia, Bangladesh, Pakistan. Um, we just opened Cambodia this year. We're looking at Myanmar. Um, so part of my um, responsibilities is making sure that our factory allocation is correct. So um, actually going over and physically walking those factories of all those places. We don't actually visit Pakistan, but the rest of them um, we do have boots on the ground, so we're um, over here quite a lot. So um, I take three trips a year. So I'm in Asia at least six weeks out of the year. So um, there's definitely um, a component of travel to the job as well, and then domestically. Um, I'm also in charge of helping with our key accounts, so um, we see Bass Pro and Cabela's, um, Shields, uh, I see the big five, so we travel to all those retailers to make sure that all their needs are being met in terms of the pre <coughs> Uh, next up, uh, voice of the customer. I think that's probably um, the best way in terms of um, market research and consumer feedback. So 
um, as PLMs, we really see ourselves as um, the voice of that customer coming through. So um, you get a ton of feedback, and as a PLM, um, it's really your job to pick um, apart and decide uh, you know, what's anecdotal and what's really important to um, how your product um, should be shaped. So um, not my quote, uh, I found this somewhere, but uh, I can't remember who, but it, it's one of the things that's always stuck with me. So the greatest weapon is um, a PLM is your pencil. So um, just taking notes on everything. It sounds um, so basic and simple, but really it's um, such a key component to everything <coughs> that we do. So all meetings and making sure that we're really um, clocking and measuring everything. So um, in terms of um, analyzing our data, that we have all those things to go back and say, Okay, where do we get this from, and um, you know, why did we decide to make these decisions? So that way, um, you know, ultimately, uh, product we don't have a crystal ball. Things don't work out a lot too, so we want to be able to go back and really analyze and say, hey, how did we get to this decision, um, and why did we ultimately make these choices? And um, you know, if you're great with your pencil, you can go back and say, hey, this, these were key customers that said this was the price point, or this was the feature set that wasn't working out, and these were. The Uh, super users, internal, external. So I hit a little bit about our external customers. So um, you know, uh, we have all of our um, product groups that we work with. That, um, you know, we can send produce to, and they, um, we want to go out and break them in the field. So um, we get a lot of that. Um, internally, we have a ton of um, super hardcore Western hunters that um, you know are in some of the nastiest climates, as well as um, you know some of the some like really rugged terrain so we know that all of our products are going to get broken and beaten up. Um, so there's a ton of really good data that comes out of that. So, um, you know, we get them back and they always, you know, we always ask them for more information or try and sit down with them, um, write it down, film it, whatever we have to do because in the moment we want to get their feedback of, you know, were you freezing last night? You know, why, where did you have this leak that came through on, you know, show and things like that. So um, we're always collecting data. Um, making sure that you're <laughs> organized and you have a place to put it, and that you're really able to go back when it matters to say, hey, why are we making these design changes? Um, and have all those um, changes to your future site and understand, you know, kind of how you got to all of them. Uh, key accounts and customer feedback. So I hit, hit on that as well. So um, all of our key accounts um, and customers. So that's part of I go with our sales team. So um, our national sales manager and I travel to line goods so before the product is even launched uh, our wholesale channel so getting their feedback on our initial concepts um, so we really rely on a lot of those partners that are already buying our goods um, to give us feedback going forward and then um, we choose some um, strategic partners to say these are people who feel like you know whatever our new product line is um, would make sense for their channel and go out and seek that feedback Um, benchmarking versus the industry, so um, tons of comp shopping, so um, I get everybody's email, so all of our retailers, every manufacturer, um, we're picking through that every single day to see you know, who's running promotions, um, who's got new product launches. A lot of that you'll get from retail partners too that are telling you, you know, these other brands are doing X, Y, and Z, but we want to look at um, what's customer facing as well and say, you know, how are people positioning, you know, what times are they running promotions? Are we really keeping up? Are we doing our part to uh, play in that promotional uh, space in the world? Um, assortment planning. So um, again, this is really uh, driven with um, a lot of our planners, uh, our planning team as well. So um, data-driven decision making. So you know, a big part of what you do is um, I'll be the first to admit it. Like I'm not a well-accomplished North, North American hunter. So. I don't bring that authentic voice and saying I killed a 300 last year and drug it out two and a half miles, right? Or I took this giant one to sell or whatever it is. So uh, for me, my biggest weapon is our data by going in and saying, hey, you know, these products didn't sell or these products, uh, you know, were returned at a higher rate because of fit. So, um, you know, it is, it's a nice mix too in terms of, you know, I'm not so connected to the product that, um, you know, I'm too close to really be able to analyze a lot of our data, so I bring a really strong data set to our team to um, look at it from another side. Also, in terms of that, too, is that, you know, my passions are really um, uh, spending a lot of time in the backcountry, so split boarding, you know, I like to ride in Rizzo, too, so 
um, having used and broken a lot of outdoor equipment my own, like I kind of um, lent my own, um, you know, kind of understanding of outdoor products as well. So we have a really nice blending our ability with um, hardcore hunters and using, you know, key accounts and retailers, um, and then using other influences too to say, you know, these are working more generalized outdoor brands, so we're not just looking at hunt specific products, right? we're looking at Mountain Hardware, Patagonia, Verona, and a lot of these um, high-end uh, technical outdoor products as well. Um, skew rationalization, so this is something that um, if you're working in the retail space right now, that you'll hear a lot of people talking about, so um, you know, retailers are really compressed in terms of um, brick and mortar is a huge investment, right? So. Um, they have lights and staffing and um, you know all the things that go into opening a brick and mortar uh, retail location um, and if SKUs aren't working that they got to pull them out right so whereas people used to say and buyers and merchants were really more charged with um, you know putting together a curated assortment that they thought really told a nice retail story now everyone's looking more in terms of you know is this SKU turning like how many products or, or how many units are we actually selling per year and does it make sense in our assortment you know, is there overlap or are we selling seven different SKUs of $99 on sale jackets? Like, why are we doing that? So um, we try to help uh, retailers do that as well. And we, um, there's a few different third party companies um, that give us um, sell through data from our retailers. So we try and help them analyze that too and say, hey, maybe this was a miss in your this year. We feel like um, there was some white space and, you know, 199 price point or a, fully taped garments that if we feel like you guys could have done after. So, um, Analysis of opportunity um, versus saturation in the marketplace. So as we're really <laughs> looking to put together a product line, um, we're looking to see what opportunities are out there, right? Like if, if everyone's doing Marina, right? So one of the biggest um, trends right now is everybody's doing Marina base layers versus, you know, the polyester versions, um, you know, a few years ago, like, is it oversaturated? Do we have differentiation in the marketplace? Like, are our products different enough um, to really make sense? Or are we just competing, competing and overlapping for um, market share that may or may not even exist? Uh, financial roll-up, so uh, another key component of the business um, portion of what I'm doing is um, projecting what our sales are gonna be, um, and I'm doing this um, every, all the way from you know very high level for our entire division all the way down to um, key customers, you know, big box retail versus independent retailers to kind of show our team and our executives. Um, you know, this is what our projections, this is what our trend line looks like, and then being able to tell them, you know, why is it that we're do? Why is it that the marketplace is reacting like this? You know, are we crushing it in base layer this year? You know, did we were we late on delivery from a factory and taped goods and that's what our rain projections are on. Um, so a lot of that comes down to PLM to um, you know, have that ability to analyze really what's going on in the business. So um, again, it's really part of product creation and part um, you know, being product centric, but at the end of the day, having a really good understanding of the business side. Anybody have any questions? Uh, so after you like get back data on a project, a project um, that's like not really big, like, in the marketplace or anything like that, uh, where does that go from there? Like, does that go like, like the developer like is start coming back and back to the stuff? So it's the initial, so it sells in to me, it sells in, and then the data itself through is not great, like it's not checking through the register. How do we? What do we do with that data at that point? Yeah. Um, Typically, um, you know, if it's the middle towards the end of the season, it's probably for us, and we're not a huge brand, like we're not, you know, we don't have as much dynamic ordering and, you know, the hunt um, apparel season is really about 12 weeks long. And so um, in the middle of that happening, you know, it's all over about the crying at that point. And, you know, we can't stop orders, like we already know most of the inventory, but for us, it, um, as soon as we see that data happening, um, we start digging in to find out why. So was a design issue? Are they seeing a massive amount of returns? Right? Is there, you know, some is there a blowout in the seam that we miss? Uh, you know, is the taping bad in the, in the garment? Is it, so we're looking for all of those um, kind of clues that will tell us, um, you know, why is this happening? So um, that's.
that's really the process. And then, um, you know, like I said, because the season is so short, we're um, looking for um, you know opportunities to help them get out of that product. So whether it's um, running it on promotion, um, you know, mark down money, some sort of strategy to help them um, get clean at the end of the year. Because you know, by the time um, holiday runs around after holiday, like that floor pad that holds. Um, hunt camo clothing, so like in the terms of like an academy or one of those retailers, it's the same pad that holds um, Christmas toys and pool goods, right? So you're not selling pools at the same time that you're selling insulated camo jackets, right? So you have to help retailers and be super aggressive to help them get through whatever inventory they purchase. So that's a lot of um, my recommendation to our sales team saying, hey, you know, these other retailers are promoting these pieces or, you know, what can we do in terms of margin to help them mark down and get out of the products. But we like to think that doesn't happen in our products perfect, but that's not our reality. So. Um, we have a couple oh, yeah, questions over here. Yes. Uh, I guess, how often do you, like, say if you have a new product that comes out to the market, how often do you analyze that data? I guess, are you always analyzing that data? Yeah, we try and, I mean, in terms of as soon as it hits the marketplace, so for us, our floor set, um, we deliver to retail in um, hopefully or usually the first couple weeks of July, and then it hits the floor for like a Bass Pro or Cabela's, um, usually first week to second week of August. So as soon as we're starting to see, as soon as they can start providing data to us, we're starting to look too, and that helps us shape. So as we're looking at current selling data, we're, in, we're using that to, you know, kind of formulate what our plan is for the fall. So, yeah. That was very similar to my question. Okay. okay. You're good. All right, cool. um, so, a few notes about production. So, um, have you guys had a developer in here to talk to you? No. Uh, you're the first one. Okay. <laughs> well, okay. We've so talked, we've talked is, is about correct. development, okay. so. Um, so what you'll see with us, so we're super flat in terms of, you know, again, we are not the size of Nike and Under Armour, so we're not super deep in our team. There's really just four of us running it. So a lot of what I'm talking about today, if you guys have a developer come in, there's probably a lot of crossover there too. So um, at Browning, we're wearing a ton of hats. So um, factory allocation would sometimes roll up to um, a senior production manager or a production manager production management team where we handle all of that. So um, in product line managers going to sales calls, um, you know, may happen every rare once in a while at a bigger brand, but for us, we're going to every single pre-line because um, that's our opportunity. Um, and, it, and we just don't have enough team members um, to really cover a lot of that. So um, talking about production, this is what we do, but by all means, don't think that this is really the norm for, you know, maybe with um, a larger brand. Um, so, um, project management, um, this is a huge part of um, my job, so from here to, um, so our products, our new product lines launch in October to our sales force, and we basically have till um, December to figure out what we're going to order for the season, so what we're playing against um, is Chinese New Year, so regardless of where you're actually manufacturing the goods, most technical fabrics are coming out of China, so we have to have our orders in and they have to be running grayish. We also have a third component in that where we're putting camo on them. Um, so they've not only got to be finished in grayish form, um, but also starting to be camoed and then they have to be cut and parceled and rolled out to um, <coughs> separate factories. And if that doesn't happen, happen until after Chinese New Year, um, we essentially will miss our season or we start talking about area units, which um, drastically reduces our margins. So, um, projections for production space. So this last trip where I was in Asia, I was maybe meeting with factories to make sure that um, you know they had production space for us. So in light of everything that's going on, I'm sure you guys are talking about tariffs in China right now, and um, kind of what you're seeing, what the other brands are doing in terms of pulling out. So our strategy about two years ago, when the first um, real tariff thing started to come about, it is was to start pulling out of China. We kind of saw the writing on the wall, um, but the drastic difference in the last six months to a lot of these places where they were willing to take low quantity orders or um, they were willing to be a lot more flexible now with all of these brands trying to pull products out of China and go to places like Indonesia and Cambodia. Um, there's a lot more competition for the production space. So um, a big part of what we're doing over there is making sure that we have solid manufacturing partners that um, you know are going to give us the space that we need and be flexible and 
um, really want to do uh, a great job. So our tagline for the brand is the best there is. So uh, we're not just producing piles of cheap shit. Like we have to have um, you know awesome products that really perform in the in the um, field. So for us, production partners, um, you know, are a huge component in making sure that um, you know we have those quality fields. So um, those sort of projections. Um, have already happened and we're trying to give them a guess and a lot of that, you know, is basically our crystal ball, us trying to look at, you know, previous sales data and say, hey, you know, we think that this is what the numbers are going to be and you know, if, we get, if we get burned or if we find out that there's, you know, a new customer that takes a huge swing at something, that's that's a big part of what we want the shop too, is going back and finding where you're going to actually make enough product to, to get that to the goal. Yes. So, do you see the future of, I guess, manufacturing technical apparel in China for like maybe the next 10 years? Or do you see that moving out to other places in maybe Southeast Asia or the early Middle East? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So, uh, you know, China really has a really technical needle because they have generations of sewers, right? So people that have been doing this for, you know, their parents were at sewing machines. Um, so really, the two things that it takes for production is uh, you know, electricity, water, and the third one is kind of an emerging middle class. So you have this ginormous pool of people that are really looking for that work. I mean, the reality is it's, it's very blue collar. So um, in terms of you're sitting in a sewing machine, um, you know, 10 hours a day just hammering your garments. It's not like, um, you know, desk work where you're pushing paper or, you know, running Excel sheets. So um, that sort of workforce already exists in China, right, where a lot of these emerging companies or emerging countries, so Indonesia, um, Bangladesh, um, Cambodia, um, are really ramping up and more production seasons they get under them, their ability levels are kind of increasing as well. So in terms of what percentage t stays in China, a lot of that's really up to the current administration, right? I mean, they're kind of forcing our hand in terms of like twenty five percent is would wreck us. Like we would not be in business if we had to pay twenty five percent tariff on top of everything we're producing right now. Um, so that's really guiding our light in terms of where we're moving. Um, we're seeing technical production out of Indonesia is um, really good right now. Um, we're not in Vietnam, and a lot of that is based on we just weren't there early enough. Um, so a lot of these smaller Southeast. Southeast Asia companies or countries are becoming saturated as people are leaving China. So their MOQs are going up, their costs are going up. Um, and if you don't have a foothold in a lot of that, in a lot of the factories, you can't find space or um, you can't find a space that you want. So they may say, hey, we can sell that for you, but you know it's going to be six weeks off your schedule, which for us is half of the season. So it doesn't work. So. It's kind of the the uh, topic du jour around our office is, is what we're doing right now, and I promise you, anybody else that comes to talk to you guys from the industry is going to show you that. Um, production timeline. So um, again, a huge part of what I'm doing um, during production season is uh, I'm on the phone every night with factories. You know, where are you guys at? What problems are you facing? How are, there, how are we looking every day? I'm asking for you know, either a whip report or, you know, where are we at? Are we cutting, like, is the fabric there? You know, if you guys, you know, it's been relaxed, are we inspecting it? Like, what's going on? Um, because one or two days in the production schedule um, affects a lot of things, actually, too. There's um, a lot of the logistics side. So actually, moving the garments once they're finished, getting them in a container and on the water um, is not as simple of a process as just throwing them in a container, right? There's a lot that goes into it in terms of um, planning and making sure that we have that space and our frame forwarder is um, prepared to pick up a lot of these things. So uh, managing that timeline is um, critical to making sure that we hit our retailers um, eight by dates. And the reality is, too, in a, in a super short season, if we miss something by even as little as two or three weeks, um, you know, that we're facing cancellations. And those goods are stuck in our warehouse for over a year, um, you know, which all affects our bottom line as well as um, turns gold. So our planning teams. Um, you know, frustrated, and all of that ultimately comes down to us making sure that we're keeping our production. Uh, delivery to customers, so I just spoke a little bit about that. Um, so uh, when it does hit our warehouse, we have a final QA, so we do some QC in the factory as well. 
Um, we have a final QA department that um, really comes over that. So a lot of what I'm doing, uh, once we have containers on our lots, we distribute out of um, Arnold, Missouri, so it's really centralized. So we can go on both coasts within three days. Um, but I'm working with our QA team to make sure that they're prioritizing you know, these key customers need products on these dates, so you know, shuffling around containers a lot, making sure that it's getting unloaded and inspected um, timely, and that we're able to turn them all out. Uh, factory allocation. So I just spoke a little bit about our, our sourcing strategy. So um, it's changing daily. So I didn't think we'd ever use Twitter as our barometer for how we um, decide what our sourcing strategy is, but that's kind of where we're at today. So. Um, Two weeks ago, when there was uh, president tweeted, we changed from 10 to 25. That you know sent us um, in a whole different direction in terms of you know, we were prepared to negotiate for 10 percent or you know find some sort of um, middle ground, but 25 percent something in that game. So um, you know, it's evolving daily, um, and it's it's actually really one of the most dynamic and fun parts of um, what I get to do. So it's exciting to a part of that and um, really be boots on the ground in terms of negotiating a lot of you know, the cost of the product as well as what our long-term strategy is too. So sewing a season and then exiting a factory is super expensive as well. So we need to understand um, what our brand is and what we're doing. So we're setting up long-term partnerships. So um, when things are changing this quickly, it just you know makes us have to keep our business incredibly back. Uh, tariffs are you talk about FDA so free trade agreements so um, there's a lot of them out there so we have Central America um, so we have a Canadian um, we have a Canadian warehouse that services our Canadian account so um, Bangladesh to Canada is free trade um, which a trans packers which is like Vietnam Cambodia I think a few more I think Myanmar now is part of that so they're all free trade to Canada but those are strategies that we're looking that we're looking at rates and additional tariffs and um, free trade. I mean, that's a huge number if you figure um, most polyester goods out of China um, have a 32% duty rate. If we can take out 32% of the cost of the product, it's like, it's huge, it's everything to us. So um, we're looking at exploring more and more um, free trade agreements. So we also have who's part of the Hope Agreement. Um, so free trade to America. has free trade um, to America so um, but in terms of what their technical abilities are going back to your question um, some of them aren't set up to really sew a lot of the garments that we need like Hades 80 can crank out um, t-shirts like in unbelievable numbers but that doesn't really help us because we don't sell you know, tons of cotton tees so um, we're looking all the time to figure out what the next thing is but again we don't we don't have the crystal ball so we have to really um, you know rely on a lot of our manufacturing partners that um, are not only in China, but a lot of them are going to find her in these different countries that they're bringing us as opportunities as well. So we're, we're looking on our own and then relying on a lot of these people to tell us, hey, look, this is the next thing to come down the line, or you know, we're going to open this new factory and us figuring out if it makes sense. Yes? How are you determining what factory to go through? Like, how do you know what's reliable and what's Yeah, it's, yeah, I mean, it's daunting. It's definitely what keeps me up at night, for sure. So, I mean, you're placing million dollar bets with people that, you know, you've spent a few hours with in Asia um, and hoping that everything works out. So, um, I mean, it's, it's daunting, right? So, um, you know, we use word of mouth. There's a lot of um, people that we know about that are working within the industry. And if, you know, you have good connections within the outdoor space, you can kind of find out what people are going through. Um, but a lot of it comes down to us being over there and spending time and figuring out, like, are these people reliable, right? And doing our best to mitigate for this, um, you know, just to get through the first season to make sure that um, we're not going to be looking for somebody to you know, our money and ran, ran. Um, it's, uh, it's It's another part of the puzzle, but... Um, you know, typically when you come into a brand, like if you're starting up as a new brand, you would use um, people that, um, you know, on recommendations. So when I started at Browning, there was um, quite a bit, there, there was an extensive, you know, we're a 110 year old brand, right? So we've been manufacturing apparel since the 60s, I believe. So, um, you know, a lot of that was in place, but it's, 
so we, we used some core factories that we were um, going to be able to do stuff. And then from my background as well, I brought in some factories from the producers. So um, it's kind of a mix between uh, you know who you know in the industry, who you can trust, and then actually getting over there to, to meet people and figure out um, you know what brands are they working with, like who are you selling with right now? So if somebody's selling for a Bass Pro or you know Sit Cut or something like that, like hey, how are these people doing for you guys? Or maybe they're being honest or not, right? But a lot of that comes down to, you know, just being able to read them. Oh, yeah. I was wondering, other than pricing, are there any other factors that drive um, companies away from sourcing or manufacturing inside of the United States? Yeah, I, I think capacity, right? Capacity in terms of we don't have this, like, massive labor force, right? As you look at Indonesia, 100 and 60 million people on an island the size of North Carolina, right? So they have a concentration of people that are looking for work. We don't, you know, we have a lot of people, but they're not condensed into an area where people are um, ready to sell. The other component of that too is um, technical fabrics, primarily um, cost prohibitive, like you said, out of not coming out of China, um, and then just our ability to uh, manufacture them in the in the scale that we would need to actually do all of that production. And then I think the other side of that too is um, really a social aspect of it too, like are we being great stewards to the land? Um, so a lot of what I'm doing too is looking at um, looking at what we're doing um, to make sure that we're not being wasteful, that we're not dumping guys back into the water. And I think that um, as Americans, we might be a little selfish in terms of like if you go over and see some dyeing facilities and washing facilities like there's some environmental concerns there too and I'm not sure that as Americans that necessarily we would be ready for that to happen um, in, on the loss hatch front right like I mean people aren't going to allow that to happen so um, but that's a big part of our social concern too that doesn't make it okay for me to you know go to Indonesia and I mean the ocean over there is beautiful some of the best surfing in the world right and just start dumping waste water because it's outside of our environment, right? So um, that's something that we're constantly focusing on, right? If we can find some sort of, uh, we can find guys, if we can find facilities that are um, really focused on the environmental aspect of manufacturing too. So uh, we partnered with, and I've actually got some slides in here um, about um, Eco Nile, who's, uh, they're rescuing ghost fishing nets off the bottom of the ocean they're spitting the nylon back into yarn and making garments with it. So it's got like a really cool retail story, but it's also, um, you know, it's cool not only for retail, but you know, it's actually doing something. Um, we're using Allied Feather, who is our chosen down supplier, or nominated down supplier. Um, only sustainable source down. Um, there's no like animal rights issues going on in there as well. Um, so they're a great partner. So, but that's where we're aligning to as well. And I don't think that most people would say like hunters are this class of people that you know we're not selling to the same people as you know, hardcore Patagonia users. Um, but I think that there's a uh, misconception about um, you know hunters care about the land. They're like stewards of the land, just like we are. Um, I'm sure you guys remember when they saved uh, Bonanza Flats like three seasons ago they were trying to put that hotel up there. It was really interesting. Uh, my wife and I were at an event. And, uh, so it was one of the Backcountry Alliance groups, right? But you have this really interesting mix. These people are, are using the exact same land to their backcountry ski or um, use it to go hunt on. Um, but everybody's kind of in the same pool. I guess that's my you know, comparison between um, generalized outdoor recreation users it's kind of a it's kind of a cool mix, and I think that that's really what um, you know brought me to uh, really have a lot of passion for the brand. Is, is people, these people just want to be outside. These hunters are you know they put a ton of money and land in conservation to just like our guys. Um, just for the sorry, that wasn't your question, but that was my fifteen minute rant about it. Uh, okay, uh, any other questions? All right, cool. So, oh, I'm sorry. No, you're good. Just, um, do you feel like working with manufacturers overseas that like, knowing the language is beneficial, or do you feel like they're pretty 
can communicate pretty good. Sure, yeah. I mean, full disclosure, like I speak no Chinese, have not made any effort, right, to, to do it. So they, they speak English. Um, it's like, if it gets really bad, like, I mean, smartphones are so, right, like you can speak into it. It's, you know, even the translating for you. So, I mean, would it be helpful for sure because you know exactly what they're saying? And you're not relying on um, some sort of translation and nothing is getting lost, but um, is it 100% necessary? Probably. But if you guys have a component of um, learning Mandarin Chinese, you will put yourself on a rocket ship in terms of your career to be able to go over there and um, do a lot of the work without having to do that. So, yeah, that's not Okay, um, so I put some slides together here just so you guys can kind of see our development process. So um, a big part of what I do is putting together PowerPoints to kind of um, sell our line internally before we're selling it to the trade, before it's actually going out to consumers. So um, this is just a little scope of um, what our research looks like. Um, so our first round presentation, so this would be our sales and executive leadership um, development and design teams would be in there as well. Um, so this is actually from our last season, so I kind of hodgepodge this together just so you guys can get an idea of what it looks like. So um, our upland research, so uh, pheasants forever and quail forever, trips to see um, hardcore upland hunting apparel. So a lot of that was um, me going out to see a lot of these groups as well as key retailers to figure out what they're selling. Um, what the opportunity was in the marketplace. Um, inspiration brands, who else we're looking at that's really crushing it out there. So it's an Arbor, oh, Hermes, Retta, Columbia, Car Harbor. So you'll see some crossover brands in there as well. Um, so we knew that the market was already wearing our Buckmark um, branded. It's here and here, so um, you know, how do we grow that? So we found a market division um, between the hardcore um, younger uh, guys that wanted technical fit, fitted garments so they could be out in the field all day. Um, and the classic guys, these guys on the right, they're wearing these like heavy cotton canvas vests that we do. Um, both sides of the market were really important to um, our overall wine strategy. Um, we knew that the key elements were um, fit, which is something we've been, since I've been there, have been working on incredibly hard um, function. Um, heritage. So for us, again, 110 year old brand is like this steward of, of the brand for this small point in time reference. So um, it's really important to me that um, we're constantly giving, um, giving concern to our heritage and that we're um, really looking at that side of the business too and saying, like, are we being good students to go and brown it? Like, is this what you really would have wanted? Not unsimilar to what other brands are going, but um, it's something that definitely weighs on us for sure. Um, next generation, again, just making sure that we're getting these guys, because these guys at some point will not be able to hunt anymore, and making sure that we have that market share uh, captured. So from there, I would uh, kind of go down and, and break it down by category. So this for us was base layer. So um, we had an NTS, which was an Nexus skin shirt. So it was this lightweight polyester shirt, moisture wicking looked you know, super fitted garment. Um, so we added a quarter zip um, for a heat dump with a new color blocking. And then we saw this opportunity in Merino, so I already said my piece about Merino, but we did OTS, which is about the skin. I guess we're super awesome at making OTS and OTS. <laughs> um, for more relaxed look, so uh, we like the raglan sleeve. Um, and then we also noticed that guy on the right does not look great in a super form fitting uh, next to skin shirt. So we wanted to make sure that we were looking at all of our consumer body types as well as um, everybody wants to wear these super um, So we make a basic call out, so 180 to 220 GSM for a wide range of temperature applications. So we're looking at what everybody else is doing in the marketplace. So as you'll notice, none of these are on specific brands. So we're looking at cues outside of our industry as well for doing development. Um, just kind of some basic price points. And then we would follow that up with some initial drawings and concepts. You'll notice there's um, not a whole lot of detail on our drawings here. So um, I'm giving all these design keys to our um, designer and he's coming back with these initial concepts and drawings. So if you guys aren't seeing it, so it would be like a giant board that we're posting up uh, with pieces and 
swatches of fabrics for them to check out, um, really get their hands um, into it as well, because we're product people, so we understand what a 180 GSM Merino is, but you talk to uh, you know sales and executive teams, not all of them understand that, so we're trying to sell them on the concept of what we're doing. Uh, so same thing, just different categories. So we're talking about outerwear, um, soft shell jacket. We found was you know most requested by the hunters. Um, we have a jacket in our big game collection that we thought was correct. Um, it's a double weave um, spandex, and then we talked about our micro check factor. So we really worked for two seasons to create this really awesome um, soft shell product. So we were talking about bringing that into the up and as well. Uh, wool sweater, so, so we partnered with Gore, so part of our agreement with Gore is that we're bringing a lot of their products into our line. So uh, we saw an opportunity in terms of flathead sweaters. Some and Berettas. I'm sorry, I forgot one, so the jacket, but. Um, so trying to infuse their brand into um, our flathead collection as well. Um, CFS rain suit is um, our uh, entry level pack for uh, jacket that we sell uh, for 50 bucks, so we're going to do a version of it. So, uh, giving them those style cues. So, what does that look like in terms of um, drawings? So, we have our one stopper label there, uh, our core uh, pro shell jacket that we did this season, um, our CFS in a full color up concept, and then what our soft shell jacket looks like. Uh, so the last thing that I would talk about, um, so we would do this for all of our categories, everything from um, bottom to base layer, outerwear, or I'm sorry, uh, hard shell, soft shells, um, everywhere, and then we would talk about our materials and fabric. So uh, what is our overall plan? We want to expand the merino. We know we're crushing it in the game, um, create a better soft shell, talk about our flat and sweaters, um, how we're going to use pro shell, and really how that um, works into our direct consumer strategy higher abrasion fabrics, um, how, what sort of styling we're going to pull from, um, and then cohesive merchandising. So we challenge our design team to put together um, a pocket that we could really use across all of our styles that would really call it out as Upland. Um, so we know that our customer um, wanted to be identified as an Upland hunter outside of being in the field. So we were looking at garments, um, making garments that they could wear casually as well as have to technical performance to them, and we identified with this pocket that held the shell, um, would really kind of tell that story. And then we would talk a little bit about our color palette, which is funny now because we actually changed all of them, but um, our storm blue did not go very well. So. Uh, and then our women's color palette down there. Does anybody have any questions on like kind of the initial concept? Okay. So this would be round two, so. Um, you know, we would really dive into um, more of a line list um, to better understand, um, you know, to better give a concept of, you know, what the SKU count looks like, where our price point's going to be. It would be a lot more fleshed out. So um, these would be line lists that we would use. Um, so each silhouette representing um, a style or SKU. Um, so they can really get a full concept of like each sub-brand. So speed for us is really um, designated for our like um, backcountry uh, western hunter. So um, it's really our place to show innovation, um, concepts, features. It's really a concept. <coughs> oh my God! Yeah, we're just about out of time. Oh my God! I thought we had a few more minutes. Um, uh, okay. Let's give Brian a hand. And then if you haven't signed the sign-up sheet, just go ahead and swing on your way out. Uh, maybe if you got any last-minute questions, you can catch us maybe out in the hallway or something. What's up? Sorry, man. Thank you.